So, now we would like to have questions from you, or is there something you would like to debate or ask any one of us? Um, because we have the next approximately 20 minutes to do so. And you will help with a microphone also? Thank you. So. No questions for Chris? <laughs> you have one. Uh, my name is Karin Koppens, and I'm from the uh, uh, University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. And you spoke a lot about how research, is, how research can be used and when it's effective. But I was wondering most, is there anything you could tell from your, uh, the reviews you have done and the research about um, how school leaders, policy makers, make the decision to go search for intervention research to use? So what is going on before they actually find an intervention and how they make the decision to choose between different interventions? Um, I don't know if this is evidence um, based or informed or my, just my personal opinion, but <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the M6, the structure, you know, um, as um, Camilla said, you know, teachers are stressed. They're very busy people doing their job, job being teachers. Um, the use of research is probably not, in the UK, it's not very much built into initial teacher training. Um, <coughs> the research that's taught is very different to the type of research I do, even though we, we work in an organization which predominantly does a lot of um, t teacher training. So the whole system and structure is not set up in a way that would encourage teachers to, to take those, those, those first steps. And even if they were and had the M, the motivation yes, to, to do that, you couldn't expect, as a teacher, busy being a teacher, to go and do all that work, to do primary research or even search, search the, the, the databases. And that's why, in health, we have this enormous infrastructure to support people. So, you have the motivation, and then you have the support structures to work with that, that motivation. So in my, my point of view, although we think it's a good idea, isn't it a good idea for research to be available to inform anybody's decision making, whatever you're doing, even if you're deciding what toothpaste to buy, it would be useful to have that, that um, information. We don't have policies for research production and use. It's, a, it's just an ad hoc system, and we're, we're all kind of dealing with little bits of it. So fundamentally, I think we need to stand back and say, if we want this to happen, what, what is necessary in the system? You need time, you need the motivation, and you need the processes and procedures and structures that would enable it to happen. It's kind of, in a way, it's obvious. <laughs> Yeah, and I could say that's the equivalent in Denmark also, because even if you're motivated and it's accessible uh, for teachers, I think it's also a question of saying, you might be able to read the research and understand what's expected of you, but how do I actually do this in the classroom? So it's also a question of saying, not only conveying the research, but also saying, how are we actually going to get um, use it in, um, in the classrooms? And also, um, I think that's one of the issues also that's going to be interesting following the next day is what can we learn from each other? We'll hear workshops about also using videos uh, where teachers are teaching some intervention that other teachers go, can go in and look at and be inspired by. So I think that's also one of the steps uh, we have to approach and say, how do we actually do it? Because one thing is making accessible reading and having databases. Another question is how are we actually going to do it in the classrooms? But you know, I gave the example of health in NICE. The guidance is guidance. It's not just saying this is the research evidence. It's saying this is, this is the research evidence. This is what we know. This is what we, we don't know. This is what the um, professional kind of skill knowledge, uh, experience, tacit knowledge um, says. This is the context in which you are working as a health professional. 
and then this is what we, we suggest. But it, you're the professional, it's down to you. So it's helping with those intermediary aspects rather than just giving some statistics and saying this is research. It's, that's too big a jump for, for, for anybody. Hello, I'm a PhD student from the University of Copenhagen. My question is about the type of, of evidence-based knowledge that is being implemented. Have you looked at that in, the, in, in your uh, reviews? Is that distinguish, uh, uh, can you distinguish between different types of knowledge and different results in implementing uh, that knowledge? Thank you. I can just say that we considered knowledge, research, evidence very broadly in the review of reviews that we did, but we did and we did collect a, a limited, limited amount of information about it, but we didn't, it wasn't something that we, that we took forward in the work that we did. So it included um, kind of routine data that was collected at, in, at schools, at school level data as well as research-based, you know, and academic and other um, research knowledge. Um, so we had a broad definition that we, so if, if the review included studies that, you know, had a wide range of types of evidence, then they were included in our review. But it wasn't something we took forward in our report. And I can say it will be something we'll take forward in our report, but regretfully I cannot at this point of time tell you exactly uh, what. But, but as I said in my presentation, we're, we are going to look at the class implementation, at the evidence base there, what are they working with there? And I can already at this point say quite a lot of it is um, behavioral interventions. And then also at the school, I'd say what are the differences and what are they um, actually working with? And can we see a greater effect of this or that? But I cannot at this point be more specific than that. But we will be looking at it and describing them thoroughly. But it has been a bit of a contested area about what is, that, what is the nature of evidence. Should it be uh, experimental evidence? Should it be more process qualitative evidence? But I think in the, f the field generally, there is a kind of merging together so that the, uh, uh, the, the uh, experimental evidence is being more aware that we need to look at mechanisms. Just having an effect size from an experiment isn't really going to help you very much in, in uh, decision making. Um, we recently did um, a review in the, in the crime area, and uh, there was three different interventions, and all three of them were kind of a little bit effective. But that, having those three numbers didn't help the, 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 the decision maker choose between them or what were the active components. So I think everyone is moving more to having the effect experimental data with um, data about process and mechanisms. And also, as Jan said, also to, to incorporate um, more routine administrative data. Particularly if you've got a research, uh, some research evidence, um, quite often it's from, from North America because mm. you know, it's, uh, it's where most of uh, the uh, research is, is being done because it's a big country and, and has a large investment in, in, in research. So how much can you apply that to, to different contexts? It's a real tension because you want fidelity of implementation, as, as Camilla said, and yet you're worried about the local context. And routine data is, is, is enabling us to, to examine how, with the mechanisms, to see how different data may be relevant to different populations in different contexts. So, it's, it's taking us a while to get there. <laughs> Slowly, we're, 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 we're being a little bit more sophisticated. I think we're always, we were a bit crude in the past, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, my name is Yari Lidikko, and I'm from uh, yeah, Special uh, Needs Education Agency in Stockholm. Uh, I try to make my question clear. I, I'm not so sure if I'm thinking clear yet, but uh, uh, especially Camilla, you had uh, compared different countries. And uh, I'm curious if you could see uh, how much the government uh, rules 
uh, the implementation. Because, for example, in Sweden, Sweden there are very many different kind of uh, implementations going on, and uh, it's more at the school level the uh, headmasters decides what they are going to do. Uh, and in compare with the Finland, for example, they had a graph game to uh, hide, uh, to increase the level of the reading. And it was more uh, government uh, ruled for all schools. So uh, what kind of differences could you see in these uh, countries and how the implementation worked? And what was the level, government or municipality or school levels? We can see quite great differences, but as I said, we're not finished with this analysis, so I cannot tell you specifically, but, but what I did say is we're going back to look at how much is governmentally decided. And it, of course, it's very different because in Denmark it's also that way, that it's up to the heads of the schools to decide what are we actually doing, or it can be a municipality implementation process, something reading or, or behavioral, social, emotional uh, interventions at school level. Um, but what we can see in countries is, uh, across the countries, it's interesting because some of the countries are much more specific. They have fixed curriculum where, where what the teachers have to work with and teach on are evidence-based strategies. So the teachers are not actually themselves looking for the research because the statewide are pr uh, providing it for them. Um, and as of yet, I cannot say that the implementation there is much better, but on the other hand, I can say the teachers are doing it because they have to. But then again, we have the fidelity there. Is that actually working? And we're not that far yet uh, in, in looking at it. But great, great differences also at governmental level at, uh, about how much is actually expected of the teachers. And we can see we would like them to do it in Denmark, contrary to in New Zealand and, and uh, Australia, they're saying, well, this is what we want you to look at and what they're working with. So these are some of the things we'll be looking at when we go further into the analysis of the 10 countries. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Rien Rau, I'm from the OECD. Um, uh, thank you very much for your uh, really interesting presentations. I was wondering about uh, the M4 mechanism, the interaction. Um, could you tell us, elaborate, uh, elaborate a bit more about uh, what works in structured interaction and, in, and what exactly is structured interaction? Because I think in many systems, <clears throat> Governments are stimulating more interaction between researchers and, uh, and uh, policymakers or practitioners, um, creating consortia of schools and researchers uh, doing proposals. Um, I would call it collaboration. So I was wondering, is there a difference between interaction and collaboration? But could you tell us a bit more on what, what doesn't work in interaction and what does work? Well, I'll, I'll start off with a general, and then Jan can give the details. <laughs> the, 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 the general thing is, is that is the, the passive um, is just, just having collaboration and um, interaction, which is passive without being focused or not attending to, the, to the, those other behavioral capacity, the motivation, the opportunity. Um, are, 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 are not, not effective. So it's not against interaction or, or collaboration, it's having greater clarity within that, what you're trying to achieve and, and the uh, behavioral changes that you, you, you need, need, need to achieve it. But Jan may be able to say about the, can you talk about the specific, the specific sub-aspects? A little bit. <laughs> yes, yeah, so if, if you have a, a group of any size, but with a small group, and they've got a specific purpose. So they're trying to, I don't know, develop, you know, teachers and researchers are getting together to, to formulate some research questions that need answered. You know, what do the teachers want evidence on? And the researchers are going to go off and do some research. So they've, they've come together and they have a specific aim in mind, and they're both working to, you know, to, 
to resolve, you know, to meet that aim, that objective. Um, so something that's got a specific aim and end that people are working together, as opposed to, although the, you know, our conference here does have an aim and a, you know, there's a general reason why we're all coming together, we're not actually working on a particular piece of work or a particular question. Um, we don't have small working groups. So in that sense, yeah, the examples where there was something else um, on top, as it were, of the coming together. Um, can't think of any other. Specific. Can you think of specific? Um, I can think of specific um, kind of negative examples. So the um, uh, our research council in the UK organises meetings between academics and policymakers. You know, drinks meetings and things like that. And. Why would you think that would, you know, everyone has a good time, but <laughs> why would you think that that was going to be sufficient to, 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 um, to, to achieve anything? And there's funding for local collaborations between universities and schools. Again, they, you know, it's great, but they just haven't gone the, the next step to specify what the, the particular goals are and how they're going to be, to be, to be, a, to be achieved. Again, it comes back to having an overall policy of what you're trying to achieve with these, with these investments. Hello, I'm Caroline Jeslings from uh, the Flemish government, uh, Department of Education. I have um, a question regarding the uh, sustainability of uh, interventions and of what has been learned and achieved in those ones. Um, we had some recent projects uh, in Flanders as well, both uh, subsidized by the government or own initiatives uh, by, by university uh, research institutes, um, doing interventions, um, and, and every time the, 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 the question is, 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 is raised, it, um, it takes a long time, at least two, three years of really, really intensive uh, collaboration between researchers or supporters or coaches or whatever they can be called. And, and, and teachers in order to really have, a, have an effect. Uh, that on the one hand, and also um, uh, another important aspect is that um, the team, the school team, um, also uh, needs to um, take the the intervention as a real momentum for organizational change. Um, if it if it is not taken up like that then it just stays at the individual level of the teachers who are participating, but it will not have an effect on the school as a whole. Is that also something that you find uh, in, in the literature? <clears throat> yes, definitely it is. Um, and as I said also, I, I, I think a very interesting uh, thing that we are seeing across both state of the field and also state of the evidence we're working with regarding sustainability is a collaborative approach, both amongst teachers, but also amongst teachers and heads of schools, but also amongst teachers and collaborative teams who are actually working to, um, to promote the intervention, whatever it may be. Um, but also what we can see is that, the, as I also mentioned, the funding and the maintenance, even when things are getting tough to maintain, um, this is what we're working to, and we are having problems now, but we need to maintain our focus. And this is also very difficult because if you have an implementation uh, process for three years, and then you can see once that's over, well, then maybe the schools lapse back to their former practices. So it is a time-consuming affair to make an intervention sustainable, um, and it's also something that really does require collaborative and, and team-building processes, but which is also difficult because this is also something, as we said, the background knowledge of the teachers also have to be supported. How do we actually work with collaborative inquiry? How do we actually work in, in teams and actually develop each other professionally? So this is one of, of the big, um, 
not barriers, but something really to have focus on and what is also focused on in the international literature. And I think the literature we looked at um, agrees with that. Again, that it's, you need the motivation, the capacity, and the opportunity, and you need all three. So um, if the opportunity goes away, the capacity goes away. But it also fits in terms of that a lot of our energies for this have been on the individual level rather than the organizational level. And that's why governance and process and structure at the organizational level may give you more sustainability than always focusing on individuals. Stefan Denzler from the Swiss uh, Knowledge Center. Um, we've learned that skills are crucial for accessing and uh, implementing research. I guess teacher training across countries varies a lot. And I wonder what is the type of scientific training required for teachers to be able later on to really want to access and to, to be able to access uh, research on a continuous uh, basis and to, to try to implement it in schools. I, I would think teacher training in a way should lie the basis for such attitudes and uh, link to this question, what's the role of the teacher trainers? I mean, I agree with you. I think it's a particular type of thing. A teacher is not, not a researcher. You can have, like in medicine, you can have people who have maybe, maybe dual roles. But in general, a teacher is, you know, skill and value is, is as a teacher rather than a researcher. Now, I'm the director of a research center, and we have IT staff. Now, they know much more about IT than I do, but I need to know enough in order to be able to manage their work. And so I'd like to see, to see teachers being in a kind of managerial role towards ward evidence. So, so in, in teacher training, to learn about systematic reviews and looking across evidence, um, whereas um, in my knowledge of initial, I'm a bit out of date, but my knowledge of initial teacher, teacher training is, is you know, doing, they learn about very you know, important things, but they tend to learn predominantly about kind of critical sociological approaches to education and what is the nature of education. And I value that tremendously, but they don't tend to, to learn more about the, the things that, that you're referring to. And, and being involved in system, you know, there's also been some grants to enable teachers to be involved in, in doing research, and they tend to be kind of very small scale local research on their own practice, which may be valuable. But I can see being involved in a systematic review when you're standing back and looking at the evidence, not running a systematic review, but, but having some involvement, would give you much more of the type of skills that you're talking about, a managerial role in relation to evidence, rather than being seen in a kind of a weak role. I don't see myself in a weak role in, in relation to IT. I see myself in a managerial role towards it. <clears throat> And I quite agree with that, but also saying that, that uh, teacher training is also very important and essential for the teachers also to know where do we actually find systematic reviews and how can we actually um, use them. And also, if teachers are going to work more evidence-based, they of course also have to have a knowledge from their own education as to what can we actually use this knowledge for and how can it influence our practice when we're at the schools. So I think teacher training plays a major role in this, also saying to where is it accessible and how can I use it? And, and how can I use it also according to all my other subjects? What, what, what is my role as a teacher in general? Yes? So I think we have time for a final question, if there are any more. No? Yes? Hello, I'm Christoph from, from Sweden. I just um, work to, as a development manager in a commune called Mönnal. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical about uh, evidence-based learning and changing overall. So I want, just want to ask you, is it any use to go on with this thinking or do we have to re rethink the whole model? Can we put in something from outside to inside or do we have to think another, in another perspective? Do you read me? 
using evidence is a way of doing this if you want to proceed, you know, development uh, in education, or do we have to think some other thoughts than putting in something from the outside research to the inside? Okay, you're starting. <laughs> um, I'm not. I, I don't fully uh, um, um, and understand your question, but I. I, maybe I guess, and there's a lot of people who are skeptical about evidence um, use in, in schools, and they have, I don't know if you have these anxieties, they have an anxiety that it's um, maybe dismissing this, this other type form of uh, research evidence, which is, which is taking a more critical approach, particularly to, to uh, government policies, and that um, evidence-informed approaches might assume a particular political and social value and just be, be wanting to implement it. But that's not how I would come across it at all. I would, I, I, I would see um, our research as being a resource, a tool that can be, can be useful to us and that you need to start with the issue and the, the question, whether that's an educational policy question or whether it's a teacher's a practice question, and then say, we've got this issue in a question, and how we resolve it will be affected by lots of things about our values, about resources, about the context we're working with, but research of different types can, can, can maybe help us, and we should at least look to see if research can help us. And that could be experimental research, it could be uh, conceptual analysis of, of, uh, of, of issues, but it's a tool, it's not, <laughs> it's not a driving us in a mechanical, mechanical way. And just to supplement you on that, I think it's important to think that when we're talking or discussing evidence-based teaching, um, it's not a question of us thinking we're giving the teachers you do A, B, and C and you'll get D. Because as David said, a lot of things are influencing what is happening in the classrooms, also economy, et cetera. But I also think it's really important to take into consideration why should we not learn from the experiences that are in research? So if this has worked well for others, perhaps I could be inspired in my own practice directly in the classroom or school-wide to actually be inspired by what others have done and we actually can see from the research this is actually something that has an effect or perhaps it doesn't or perhaps actually it's doing the exact opposite as what we were hoping for. Yes, Q. All right, so I think this concludes the first session. Um, just a little bit practical. Lunch will be served in the assembly hall, which is down in the bottom of this building. And we have decided today, or I have, that uh, you of course have to have a traditional Danish lunch. So you're having open-faced sandwiches, smagasbrød as it's called. A little practical information is also that when lunch is done at one o'clock, there are four workshops. And I can tell you at workshop one and two is on this floor and there will be signs on the door. And workshops three and four will be on the fourth floor all the way on top of this building. Uh, and again, there will be signs in the door. For those of you who are doing workshops, I've already told you, but I will repeat myself, that we'll, there will be a staff member from Clearing House in each of the rooms. So they can perhaps assist you if you're having difficulties, or at least they can assist you in finding where we can get assistance to help us. So, but we expect it all to work out very fine. And the last practical is, when you're done in your workshops, there will be a half a minute's coffee break with cake, which everyone looks forward to, and then we will commence in here again at 3 o'clock. So have a nice lunch and enjoy your workshops. Thank you. Thank you.